Hello, welcome to Memo Conversations. I'm your video, I'm your host, Osman Bud, video producer. My guest today is Khaled Fahami. Khaled Fahami is an Edward Keller professor of North African and Middle Eastern at uh, Middle Eastern at Tufts University, educated at the American University in Cairo and at the University of Oxford, and having taught at Princeton, NYU, Columbia, Harvard, and Cambridge universities. He is, a, he is a historian of the modern Middle East, special, with specialist emphasis on the 19th century Egypt, which is actually going to be our discussion today, mostly. Um, his books and articles deal with the history of the Egyptian army in the first half of the 19th century, as well as the history of medicine, law and urban planning. Through work, uh, Throughout working on such topics such as conscription, vaccination, quarantines, forensic medicine and legal uh, torture, he charts the specific ways in which a modern state was established in Egypt and in the manner in which Egyptians accommodated, subverted and resisted the institutions of a modern state. In addition to his academic publications, which have appeared in both English and Arabic, Bahami is also, act and is also an active and regular and social media user, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Clubhouse, as well as bilingual blog at Um, Over the past few years, he has been using social media platform to share ideas about his new academic project, a military, social and cultural history of the 1967 Arab-Israeli conflict. Khaled, welcome to Memo Conversations. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And it is our pleasure to have you. Um, I wanted to dive straight in. Um, you've got quite a diverse range of interests here. I mean, obviously, it sort of deals with modern history more broadly, but you've got military, you've got medicine, you've got urban planning. You're talking now about the Arab-Israeli conflict as well. But what was it about history that drew attracted you specifically? And why did you pick, you know, the 19th century and afterwards specifically what what is it about that period as well as studying history generally that attracts you it's a good question i actually didn't study history academically i studied economics uh, as my undergraduate and then uh, did a master's in political science but i've always gravitated towards history because even as an undergrad uh, because i i thought that it is um, a better way to understand modern modern times, modern society. Um, economics was for me disappointing because the way it is being taught is microeconomics and I wasn't really interested in a banking career or um, and even when I wanted to understand how the economy worked, I thought I found that economic history uh, helped me. In fact, the first, history classes I took were economic history classes I took at the American University in Cairo, which is where I got my degree from, my BA and my MA. And political science was equally disappointing for me. It, um, it offered a static picture, and I wanted to know where things were coming from, not to escape to the past, but to use the past as a way to understand the present. And I've never been disappointed. I always think that my 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 uh, historical knowledge gave me a tool to understand the current moment as far as the 19th century in particular it is i think a foundational period in 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 um, in modern uh, middle eastern societies and specifically modern egyptian society and i wanted you know as, as someone who is you know, politically conscious and publicly aware, uh, you know, I wanted to understand where, where our predicament, we are in a very deep moment in, uh, in our history, um, Egyptian, I mean, in, on so many levels. And I, I wanted to know where this came from. And I thought that this whole question about modernity, which is, of course, a very big term and it's very ambivalent and ambiguous and confusing, uh, but and and of course westernization and our relationship with the West uh, uh, is an old, of course, relationship. It didn't start in the 19th century, but something different happened in the 19th century. And I thought that it, initially I thought I would study actually the 18th century. My idea was that if I go to a period before that very titanic confrontation with colonialism in the 19th century, I can study uh, 
you know, Egyptian society in a pristine form. Uh, and of course, there's no pristine form. There's always contact. There's always influences here and there. So bit by bit, um, well, very early on in my DPhil, I mean, I did my, my DPhil in, in Oxford, and my supervisor, Roger Owen, was an economic historian of Egypt. And he told me, you know, maybe if you move to the 19th century, you'd be better able to answer the kinds of questions you're asking. Actually, this was going to be my question, because uh, my, when you start talking about your interest in the 19th century and mentioning you came into history via economics, I wondered whether the interest in the 19th century was partially driven because you have this idea in the 19th century called the rise of um, the homo economicus, the economic man, the man who thinks in terms of economic rationality, and that in the 19th century was the big moment this all happened, where we sort of moved to a system where everyone is thinking in terms of economics for well-being and all these big questions. Well, uh, yes, although I was interested in the macroeconomic rather than the micro, so I wasn't interested in the appearance of the homo economicus, but I was interested in Egypt's uh, um, in the involvement of the Egyptian state in the economy uh, and in what appeared to be the um, a leading um, state-led development project uh, in the first half of the 19th century in Egypt that is pioneering as far as the region is concerned, the Middle Eastern region, the Arab world region, um, whereby we, we see a... a uh, what appears to be a well-coordinated, well-orchestrated attempt by something called the Egyptian state to catapult the economy uh, further. And I thought that um, I could do this by studying an institution that was, I thought, pivotal in this economic development program. And that institution actually, surprisingly, is the military. And the idea was that there's a new conscript army, but this conscript army was actually relying on uh, domestic, I mean, it's a conscript army, so of course it, it relies on local uh, the, the, the demography and the local manpower, but also um, there were many institutions that were built to serve that army, including uh, the first factories that Egypt witnessed. So I thought... I would study the army as an economic unit, the entrepreneurial spirit that might have been instilled in the managers of these uh, proto factories, um, the development of a, a labor force, uh, but also the army as a market for products that these uh, factories were producing. That was the initial project. Eventually, I actually uh, I, I, I didn't study the army as a military institution, of course. I did study some battles, some wars that this army was engaged in. But primarily, I was interested, I became interested in the social history of the army and the experience of the uh, peasants who uh, were conscripted, th that is the soldiers, um, their connection with the with their officers and their understanding of this new enterprise and of the kind of... Um, of wars, where these national wars that they believed in and were ready to sacrifice their lives for, or were these different kinds of wars, which is what I ended up arguing, dynastic wars, uh, that they were dragged into it against their wishes. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about because when we think, even when we think about militaries in today's context, we only tend to think about it in terms of specifically fighting wars, types of weapons they might have. But, you know, even in modern warfare, you know, what sustains a military when you hear, for example, the Pentagon has a certain budget, a large chunk of that budget is actually not spent on weapons and soldiers. It's spent on bases, building, uh, you know, restaurants for the soldiers to go to. It's all of these logistical things. Um, and I think in many ways the rise of... Cause you know, historically, one of the big problems armies have always had is the ability to maintain an army when it's on the march. And so one of the big marches towards uh, modernization, as it were, is keeping your army alive and fed. Um, and so it, 
it's interesting to me when you talk about 19th century Egypt is and you talk about the factories, you talk about all these different things. This is, you know, Egypt building a modern army, which is sustained through these support networks, which in turn develop the country as a whole, too. Absolutely. And one of the campaigns that this arm, I mean, so I, I paid is exactly what you're saying. I paid very close attention to the logistical side of these campaigns. And this army fought in various parts of what we now call the Middle East. It fought in Arabia, it fought in Sudan, it fought in Syria, but also it fought in Anatolia against the heartland of the Ottoman Empire. And it fought in the Greek War of Independence alongside the Ottomans against the Greeks. So one of the campaigns I was looking at is the naval campaign that Ibrahim Pasha, who is um, the, the head of the army, um, he had about 20,000 newly conscripted troops that he took by sea to Crete and from Crete to the mainland. And the logistical, I mean, this is a, an army that is only 15 years old, if, if even that. In fact, that army is only five years old. Um, that Navy is literally five years old. And for that uh, uh, transportation, just before any bullet had been fired, just that feat of moving 20,000 troops from Alexandria to, um, um, to Crete and from Crete to uh, the southern, uh, southwestern, southeastern tip of the peninsula, of the Morean Peninsula, the Penapolis, was compared to what Napoleon had accomplished in Egypt itself when he invaded Egypt in 1798. But that's a much more formidable army and a much more centralized state. Um, and these were comparable in terms of um, uh, difficulty and in terms of comparative uh, strength of the state. So you're absolutely right. Questions of logistics. Um, uh, and, and this is what made Napoleon, of course, the genius that he was. He had this uh, you know, strategic mindset, but he was also very, very concerned about the psychology of his troops, of his men, but also the questions of supply. Um, yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting one. It's a topic we'll come back to in a moment. Um, but I wonder if we could zoom out a little bit. And I wonder if you could sort of paint us a picture. Um, so when we think about life in the 19th century for the average person as they experienced it in Egypt, how was that different from the 18th century? Well, Egypt had been part of the Ottoman Empire since 1517. Um, so... It's part of this large um, um, empire that is multi-ethnic, multi-religious. Of course, Islam is, is, is central in it, but it's uh, the you know other religions and other confessions. It's ruled by in a centralized way from Istanbul, but uh, in Egypt there are these uh, governors sent from Istanbul to run the province, which is considered to be one of the wealthiest provinces of the empire. And Egypt trades and interacts with different uh, parts of the empire. For example, Egypt doesn't have timber, doesn't have wood, uh, but it has uh, grain. It's a rich agricultural you know, country. Way back under the, the, the Romans, Egypt was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. It became the breadbasket of the Ottoman Empire. In exchange, it receives wood, which is important to... Um, uh, to build a navy, but it's also important for agricultural purposes, clearing out the dikes and the canals and the water wheels and all of that. So this is, you know, this is the kind of, 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 of economy. Um, Egypt is ruled by um, this Ottoman governors, but also there's a local kind of a militia, there's a local uh, old military household, the so-called Mamluks, that had been ruling Egypt since the 13th century. They were deposed by the Ottomans, but they were allowed to, uh, to control their land, their fiefdoms. They're basically an, a, a landed aristocracy, even though ethnically they're not Egyptian, they're actually slaves replenished by 
uh, slave levies from the Caucasus in around the Caspian Sea, and and these um, warlords like the samurai, if you want, each would have their own households, and the Ottoman governor comes and go, but the effective uh, rulership of Egypt and its economic exploitation is done at the hands of these Mamluks. What we see in the 19th century, beginning of the 19th century, two momentous events. First, uh, the French come un under Napoleon, as I said, in 1798, and what was expected to be a foundational stepping stone for an empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. That failed, it didn't succeed. As we know, uh, the British uh, attacked the, the French Navy and sunk the, the fleet. So the French basically lost the communication with the mainland and became entrapped in Egypt. And of course, the campaign was doomed from day one as a result. So it didn't last for long. It lasted for only three years. The French left in 1801. Uh, the Mamluks are very, very um, weakened. And um, the country reverts back to Ottoman rule. But Interestingly, a very interesting new development happens in the name of one person who is, whose name is Muhammad Ali, or to use the Turkish pronunciation of his name because he was an ethnic Turk, Mehmed Ali, who comes from an Ottoman town of Kavala, which is now in northern Greece, which was part of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Sultan sends a contingent of troops from that region. He joins it. He sends that contingent to Egypt to fight the French and kick them out of Egypt. Um, and Mehmed Ali is part of that contingent. Um, and he stays. He stays because he saw the, 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 the opportunity that can, he saw a power vacuum. He saw a rich country. And he had built through these campaigns, connections with um, uh, an Albanian contingent that came with him that became the most effective fighting force. And over four years, he elbowed his way up to effectively monopolize power in Egypt and force the Ottoman Sultan to establish him, him and appoint him as governor of Egypt. That changed things fundamentally. And Muhammad, so this, is ha this happened in 1805. He stayed, believe it or not, from 1805 until he went mad out of senility, uh, old age senility in 1848 and died the following year in 1849. So it's 43 years of rule, during which time the face of Egyptian society and economy changed fundamentally and also its relationship with the Ottoman Empire. So very briefly, the Mamluks were gone. He literally massacred them in one swoop, in one uh, act on the 1st of March, 1811, he invited them to a banquet and killed them off. So that military uh, elite that also controlled the country culturally, politically, and economically was literally wiped out in this one massacre. Um, then he brought his own uh, family from Kavala, his own friends from Kavala and, and its environs. And they came and with them, he established a new elite. And with that new elite, he changed the nature of government in Egypt. He maintained a very faint link with the Ottoman center, um, but he basically ruled this very wealthy province in effectively an independent manner. And he midway through his career, his long career in 1821, he took a very fateful decision to found this army that I ended up studying. And with that army, he managed to entrench himself even more firmly in Egypt. And then 10 years later, in 1831, he turns against the Ottoman Sultan and defeats the Ottoman army in successive confrontations. And 10 years later, in 1841, the British, the Austrians, the Russians, and the Prussians, not the French, came with the uh, Ottomans to basically tell him, OK, what do you want? Uh, you've occupied so many areas of the Ottoman Sultanate, uh, Syria and Crete and parts of Anatolia and the Hejaz and Yemen. Uh, 
we tell you you cannot get away with this. Um, if you return these lands, we can recognize you as a hereditary stable ruler of Egypt, which is what he did. This is how Egypt didn't become independent, uh, but it became semi-independent with a local dynasty, which is him and his descendants. So that is how things changed. Basically, the most important thing is that the old political uh, establishment was wiped out. And in its place, not only do we see a family centered around him, a dynasty centered around him, but really most importantly, we see all the trappings of what we now call a modern state, modern bureaucracy, a modern army, a modern police force, a modern navy, um, and many, many institutions of hospitals and schools and printing houses. All of these have changed the nature of Egyptian society uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very deep and fundamental way. I wanted to come back to something you mentioned uh, when you talked about Muhammad Ali Basha. Um, you also mentioned he was born in Greece, but he's of Turkish ethnicity. And this raises a question in my mind as to thinking about it from the 19th century perspective. What did it mean to be a Turk ethnically? I mean, was it because we obviously today have a certain conception of ethnicity and what that means? It usually means, you know, lineage. It usually means, you know, some people it means genes but throughout the ages the term ethnos has had a different meaning it a wider meaning so i'm wondering in this point in the 19th century what does it mean in the context of muhammad ali pasha well the context is the context of the ottoman empire and as far as the ottoman ruling elite cultural political religious elite turk is an uncouth rough illiterate peasant from anatolia who speaks turkish um, so we're talking about the Turkish-speaking part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the word Arab equally connoted something very similar as far as that Ottoman elite is concerned. Um, an Arab would be um, an equally uncouth, rough, uncivilized peasant of the Ottoman of the Arabic-speaking provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this is the attitude of a cosmopolitan, sophisticated, multilinguistic uh, elite who spoke Arabic, who understood the Quran, they knew the Arabic of fiqh, but they also knew Turkish, and they also primarily knew Persian. So they pride themselves of writing Persian poetry, of knowing the Quran by heart, maybe, um, and uh, so that is the that is the sophisticated cosmopolitan Ottoman elite that looked down on being Turk. And Muhammad Ali or Muhammad Ali is one such Turk. He's uneducated. He's illiterate. Uh, he'd never set foot in the capital. He comes from a very small provincial town of Kavala. Um, so in that sense, he fits the bill. Um, and uh, the reason we, I refer to him as a Turk, I refer to him as a Turk because he spoke Turkish uh, primarily. Um, I think his identity was Ottoman, not in that cultural sophisticated sense, but in the sense of paying allegiance to the Ottoman Sultan, believing in and belonging to this world which existed had existed for five centuries and there was no reason not to be, to, to believe that it can continue to exist for another five centuries that is the world that he grew up in and that is the world that his ancestors and the ancestors of his ancestors grew up in so in that sense he was um an ethnic Turk. The reason, I mean, the, you know, that I'm, I'm referring, the, the reason I'm referring to him as a Turk is that within Egyptian nationalist historiography, they, of, they depict him as the founder of modern Egypt for the reasons I mentioned. There are good reasons, but in terms of his own identity, of course, identity is a very confusing term. Um, and uh, there are people who think of identity in racial, ethnic uh, manners. Um, there's a gesture that I think is very important. I think it, it, it shows you both what he did, but also how I think of his identity. 
I said he uh, he arrived in Egypt in 1801. He became the governor of Egypt in 1805, and he's lasted till 1848. The massacre of the Mamluks, of Mamluks happened in 1811. But even before that massacre, in 1809, he decided to build the mausoleum for himself in Egypt. Now, that tells you something about his identity, but not his identity in the classical sense of who his ancestors were, what kind of blood fl flew in his, uh, in his veins, or what kind of language, but his identity of future identity of what his, where he, I mean, where you want to be buried tells you a lot about where you think you belong. And he thought that he actually now, even before getting rid of the Mamluks, that he will actually die in Egypt, that he has now become Egyptian. He never went native. He never spoke Arabic. He continued to look down. He became Ottoman in that sense. He looked down on the Arabs of Egypt the way the Ottomans would look down on Turks of Anatolia. They are incapable of rule. They are uncivilized. They are, of course, entitled to protection. Uh, this is what he, as a Muslim ruler, would think. You know, he, they have rights of life, they have rights of property, but they are not really capable or entitled for any leadership positions. This he kept for Turkish-speaking uh, members of his elite. I want to come back to the Mamluk massacre because I think I'll be an interesting for our audience. But before we get there, um, basing what you're saying, because of course, as you've as we've said, um, Muhammad Ali Pasha is not from Egypt. He does come to Egypt. But why do you think he had developed that attachment to Egypt specifically to the point where he wants to stay and do all of these things? Well, Egypt is fabulously wealthy and there's nothing for him back in Kavala. I mean, he was a ruffian. He was a he, he was a, a village uh, hitman. Uh, he never received any education. His uncle, his maternal uncle, is reputed to have been the governor of Kavala. So he's not completely poor, but he's a troublemaker and he has no business. I mean, he married above his rank. He married a, a wealthy widow um, from a town close by to the north of Kavala, and he most likely ran her business. Uh, they had together five children. So he had a family. He had some business in Egypt, in Kavala. Uh, but to be a governor of Egypt, I mean, that's a huge uh, boost to his, uh, his status. Um, so once he thought that this is, I mean, Egypt, he developed its potentials very, very significantly. But even in 1805, 1806, 18, up to the moment in which he built his mausoleum, 1809, uh, he could see the fabulous wealth of the country. Uh, he could see the enormous potential if it's put together. Um, uh, and uh, so that is how, that is what attracted him to Egypt. And this is not the first in Egypt's history. There are many people, you know, when the, when the Romans came to Egypt uh, with uh, Anthony, Cleopatra and, um, and Augustus Caesar, uh, Augustus um, made Egypt his province, a personal province. It's not part, no senator was allowed to set foot in, in, in Egypt. Um, he understood how important this is. Egypt, whoever controls it, can control politics in Rome in enormously significant uh, ways. Um, throughout Islamic rule of Egypt, there are those governors who the Abbasid caliphs would send, Ahmed ibn Turun is one, Ikhshid is another one, who would say, oh, you know, uh, this, is, this, is, this is very good. You know, why do I go back to another province? Let me uh, strike roots here, seek some kind of semi-independence, if not complete independence, and found an empire. Egypt is wealthy enough to sustain an empire. So he is not really unprecedented in, in this gesture. Yes, it's very interesting. But even as you're sort of speaking, I can't help but wonder whether there was in his mind or you know, some kind of analogy to the prophet himself, because there's a few overlaps in you, the way you describe his biography, you know, reported to be illiterate, which the prophet was reported to have been. 
married a wealthier, older woman, which the prophet obviously did. And they wonder whether came from nowhere, you know, and where they sort of wonder whether to his mind there's a kind of not a religious uh, connection, but a sort of almost symbolic uh, I linkage. Thought, I have to say, I thought of it. You're the first person who picks up this uh, this analogy, this connection. I I, th- I thought of it uh, for the exact reasons that you mentioned. I don't think he um, um, he never uh, he probably was aware of it. I mean, he's illiterate, but he knows. The, his Quran. He was a practicing Muslim. He, um, we know through his uh, waqf um, uh, that he established in his hometown that he um, he knew uh, what the tradition was. But in all his encounters with all visitors, European and Ottoman, um, and all his pronouncements about who he is what his background is, because he spoke a lot. He gave many interviews. Um, He never mentioned that. He never hinted. Of course, that will be a very, very pompous thing to say, but he never did it himself. And instead, his reference points were very different. He would pride himself of being Macedonian like Alexander, ending up in Egypt like him. He compared himself to the Ptolemies, not to the Romans and not to the Mamluks uh, and not to the Ottomans, but to the Ptolemies. So the Ptolemies were descendants of Ptolemy, who is uh, one of the generals of Alexander. So he's also Macedonian, ended up in Egypt and founding an empire based on running the economy very much similar to him. Uh, He became interested with with the decipherment of the hieroglyphics uh, under Champollion, which happened in his reign, and and he met Champollion personally. And Champollion gave him uh, the first account that Champollion wrote of ancient Egyptian history. He became interested in the history of Ramses II as a builder. Uh, He might have compared himself to him, But most importantly, he compared himself to Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, And this is something that the French in the 1830s, when they are rehabilitating Bonaparte and his legacy and repatriating his remains and reburying him in in, in Paris, uh, they were interested in making this connection too. And this is why when I said earlier, the French were not part of this um, concert of, of, of Europe in the famous uh, convention of London in 1841, because the French were backing him. Uh, so they were backing him because they too believe that he is the Napoleon of Egypt and that he would continue what Napoleon left unfinished. So he, he used to pride himself to being born in the same year, which actually is not true. Uh, I think Bonaparte is born in 1769, he's born in 1770, if not 1771. Uh, But he made this connection very, very explicitly, I think for propaganda reasons, but I think he thought of himself along the same lines. Mm. Uh, So not the prophet, but Napoleon. Well, I for some in Europe, that's another kind of prophet, <laughs> Napoleon. Um, and he does, uh, I mean, when, for example, historians talk about the birth of the so-called modern age in the Arab world, they talk about Napoleon's invasion of Egypt as the pivotal moment. Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting one to think about. But perhaps you could for now take us to the um, Mamluk massacre of the, at that uh, dinner party. I mean, how does that happen and what happens? Um, uh, The context is the following. He is appointed as governor of uh, Egypt by the Ottoman Sultan. Um, The Ottoman Sultan is having difficulties in various other parts of his far-flung empire. And in the beginning of the early years of uh, the 19th century, uh, in Arabia appeared a, a new sect, if you want, a new uh, trend 
that was challenging Ottoman control of the holy lands of Mecca and Medina. And that, of course, is the Wahhabi movement uh, that allied itself with the Saudi tribe from eastern uh, Arabia. Then they invaded the West, uh, the Hijaz, and they captured Mecca and Medina and suspended the annual pilgrimage thinking and accusing the Ottoman caravans, the pilgrimage caravans of not being puritanical and orthodox enough. Uh, now, the Ottoman Sultan considers himself as the protector of the holy sites. This is one of his epithets, one of his titles. So that was a huge blow to him. The Ottoman Sultan is weak um, militarily, so he sends uh, orders to his provincial governors of Damascus and Baghdad and Egypt to themselves send military forces to uh, evict the Wahhabis out of Mecca and Medina. Uh, the governors of Mecca, of, um, of Damascus and of uh, Mosul and Baghdad and Basra do not answer the Sultan's plea, but he did. So he gathers enough troops and he sends to the Ottoman Sultan uh, a message saying, now my troops are ready. I'm appointing my younger son, who I think at that his name is Tosun, was probably 17 years old at that time, uh, to lead, lead the campaign against the Wahhabis. Um, so the Sultan approves and sends a Ferman, a Sultanic edict, officially appointing um, Tosun head of the campaign to celebrate this because it's a huge honor. Um, uh, he decides to have a banquet uh, in which uh, the fair man would be unfurled and read aloud to all dignitaries. So that is the context, that is the occasion, that's the pretext with which he invited them. Uh, they were at loggerheads. They had been fighting each other for the previous four years, but they thought that this is, okay, um, an honor to his son. They probably was an invitation they could not turn down. Uh, the order was to come in your regalia, in all your uh, divani costumes. So they came with turbans and fur coats and elaborate costumes. Uh, to, uh, to It was not dinner, it was coffee. And the coffee, of course, is a big thing in the Ottoman Empire. It's uh, um, how you drink coffee and how you smoke tombak um, is a ritualized performance. Um, so they all came. They had a chat with him. They drank their coffee. Uh, the fair man was, uh, was read. It was a big festive moment. And then on their way down from the citadel, they were trapped in a small narrow alleyway leading down from the citadel of Cairo up in, in the hills overlooking the city to the city itself. And uh, orders were, were given. Of course, this was pre-staged uh, pre, pre, pre and, and uh, um, only three people had heard, had knew about it. Uh, so even his sons didn't know. Tusun himself didn't know. Uh, so on that signal, uh, the gates of this alleyway were locked, were closed, they were trapped inside, and from rooftops, uh, Mehmed Ali's men fired at the trapped um, uh, uh, emirs. Now think of, I don't know, I don't want to give metaphors or similes or comparisons, but think of an elite, think of um, members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons together, being trapped together. I mean, and the business elite uh, in, one, in one gathering. So it was that significant. I mean, these people, each one have their own slaves. So their slaves are in their households and their lands, but these are the big heads, uh, 400 of them. Uh, so once these were killed, literally massacred, uh, Mehmed Ali's troops and his sons descended on the, the estates of the Mamluks throughout the country, which is a campaign that lasted for months. And they, tra traced the, they tracked them down all the way to the second cataract in Nubia, in, in Sudan. 
Um, and this is how the massacre happened. It, the one event on the 1st of March, that's when the leaders were literally massacred, and then subsequent months, successive waves descending on their estates, their harems, their households, their property, and their slaves. It was uh, quite a momentous event, uh, and it's what transformed Egypt. Um, but one of the things uh, about a lot of your work is, I um, mean, for example, you wrote a book called In the Quest for Justice or In the Quest of Justice, uh, where you look at things around forensic science uh, and autopsies and these sorts of things and the arrival of 19th century Egypt. And I think what's really quite impressive about this is that you try to understand what this would have looked like from the perspective of non-elite Egyptians. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about because it's very hard to write about. Um, so thinking about all the different changes that were happening in 19th century Egypt, what was life like for the non-elite Egyptian? Well, it continued to be very tough. Um, you know, the, um, the Egyptian, uh, I mean, modern Egyptian historiography prides himself, uh, prides Muhammad Ali, as I said, for being the founder of modern Egypt, of opening these schools and factories and hospitals. And I wanted to say, okay, that is true, but what did the Egyptians actually feel about these institutions? Did they actually go willingly to these hospitals, to these schools? Did they work freely in these factories? Um, so I picked uh, basically two institutions, the medical institutions with all its practices, including the hospitals, but also the legal institution, the new, um, they were not called uh, courts, they were called councils, uh, but also the police force. How did Egyptians approach the police? How did Egyptians approach these new institutions of the state? And that, as you said, is a difficult, methodologically um, difficult task because obviously these were illiterate Egyptians, 99% of them, so they left no written records that can assist the historian to find out what it is that they thought about what was really happening to them and to their cities, their villages, their societies, and their bodies. So um, I picked... I, and, and given that we don't have, given that I cannot really write intellectual history or cultural history of non-elites, I thought I could zoom in on practices, on things that I can detect as a historian, kind of physically, I don't mean this literally, but things that are happening to the body rather than to the mind. And this is why I became interested in quarantines and vaccinations and uh, registration of births, um, post-mortem examinations, and the records, which of course are the records of the state. They're not private records of these Egyptians, but they're records of the state and the records of these institutions. They write about um, the reaction of peasants and the reaction of city dwellers to the vaccination, the smallpox vac vaccination campaign, or to registration of uh, births, or the post-mortem examinations that were mandatory to ascertain, especially during pandemics, the cause of death. So through the state sources, I thought I could detect um, Egyptian reactions to the question that I had started with 20 years earlier this thing called modernity. So I broke down this thing called modernity to very new novel and I dare say modern practices um, uh, like vaccination, like registration of births, uh, like post-mortem examinations. Um, and this way I could avoid the very loaded way of speaking about uh, modernity in cultural terms. This is an invasion from the West. This is uh, cultural um, indoctrination. These kinds of things that occlude, in my mind, the picture and, and turn it into a murky one. I wanted to see what do people actually think, what did people say, and so not say, what did people do in reaction to these practices, also conscription, and to try and deduce from the recorded from the records about their actions, something that they might have been thinking about. 
So I go from the physical reaction to hypothesize about what the what these actions reflect or what they might reflect about their thought patterns. Yes, it was a it was a very interesting one as well because um, one of the things you showed in that book on in the quest of justice um, or for justice. Um, is that a lot of them, you know, as soon as the tools were becoming available um, for modern investigations when a crime was committed, whether that was through autopsy or whatever it might have been, there was an eager embrace of a lot of these things because the uh, wanting of justice was quite great from what your descriptions that you gave in that book. Absolutely. The, you know, the, the, um, I found in police records many, many instances, many cases in which it wasn't actually the state that is asking for an autopsy. It was the families of the loved ones of the you know the of the victims, and they do they do so because they have no recourse to other means to establish evidence. So, especially when it is a kind of a politicized case, and I don't mean politics on the national scale, but politics, let's say, on a village level, when let's say the village head or his cousin or his son is the one who killed that peasant over a fight over land or irrigation water or um, usually agricultural disputes. Um, and because he's the village head, because he's the local governor, uh, the eyewitnesses are afraid to step forward. And the next of kin would then you know, of course, the majority, as we now know, as we know naturally, in, 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 in cases like these, these are very difficult, intimidating circumstances. And most people would turn a blind eye or not turn a blind eye, but to say, okay, what, what do I do? What, you know, I need to bury my son. But some cases uh, end up dramatically differently. And they would say, no, my son had been murdered. And I would not bury him before getting my justice, his justice, his due. Uh, and if that uh, necessitates uh, opening up his body, conducting an autopsy to prove that this was not natural death, um, and even if that even entails exhuming the body after it had been buried, to undergo this very emotionally difficult operation, then I am willing to do this. And I and these are the cases that I found in the archives and 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 they struck me as very dramatic and as requiring um, a, uh, a, a, a uh, my respect and requiring my attention. Now this book took me 15 years to write and it's a lot of research because you know I, I'm not speaking about hundreds of cases, I'm talking about tens of cases, but each one of these cases is so dramatic. I mean, they can make an amazing movie. Each one of them is so dramatic. They're not entertaining, I mean, they're entertaining, but I don't want to demean them by saying they're just interesting. No, they they require, they require attention, they require, I mean, these are people who, um, who have dignity, uh, who have honor, and of course, an enormous amount of courage to, st to stand up to power in this way and to insist on their rights and to go against what one can assume to be societal norms, the religious norms, but also human instinct. You know, that you, you bury the dead. You don't open up the body of the dead. Um, so that is what pushed me to study medicine and law and what this, what forensic medicine entails? What does actually opening up a body entail? Who are these doctors? What are these hospitals? What are the schools in which the, these doctors receive their medical education from, and so on and so forth? So it's a tapestry that took me fifteen years to paint. It was uh, quite a tapestry you did end up painting. Um, before I get to my very last question, um, you sort of in your bio we mentioned that you're doing a project on the Arab-Israeli war of 1967 specifically in relation to Egypt what is this project that you're doing and could you explain it to us a little well it obviously is very different from forensic medicine 19th century 
Uh, so it's a very different kind of project. Um, of course, it's a different, in a sense, country. You know, uh, 19th century Egypt is very different from 1960s Egypt. Um, and um, it again, you know, 1967 is, is the pivotal moment in modern Egyptian history. Uh, I think it is the most important moment in 20th century Egyptian history. And it's a catastrophic defeat that I think that I think we still live. Uh, we, we live there is the I mean we are in my mind, and this is very difficult for me as an Egyptian to verbalize and to articulate, but we are a defeated nation. Um and um our leaders do not want us to recognize and realize that we are a defeated nation. So that's where the politics of this project comes in. Uh, and I don't want to just say defeated nation because I am I have some masochistic tendencies, but I, um, I, I want to understand the present moment. And I think this is a pivotal uh, moment. I mean, it's an interesting defeat. It's a defeat that the Egyptians refuse to accept. That is also a very inspiring moment that the Egyptians decided not to capitulate. They decided not to sign a peace treaty on these terms. And they decided to live to fight another day. Um, so I'm interested in, um, in the, I mean, this, of course, defeat, you can imagine, this has been in hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of books written about it, um, and plays and novels and, and movies uh, and poetry. But um, uh, I think um, paradoxically, and maybe not surprisingly, the details of the war, the military details of the war are not written about. So people write about the impact of the war on theater or on Egypt standing in, 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 in the world or the rise of Islamism, you know, all of these kinds of macro analyses uh, w w without actually describing um, it's actually not even six days, you know, the Israelis call it the six-day war. In Egypt, it's actually 72 hours. Um, it's, if even that, it's three days of, of war, but three days that, of course, changed the, the, the face of the country. And I'm interested in finding out what happened in these three days. So um, I, you know, I studied Muhammad Ali Wood for 43 years, Um and the second project is a project that spans many, many decades. This project spans three days, but of course I buttress it by zooming out and, and, and painting things before and after. But I want to understand what this war, how this war was fought. Um, I want to understand how and why the defeat took the form it took, which is a devastating, thorough and complete defeat. And that requires um, not only a military explanation, it requires a political, cultural, economic, geostrategic explanation. Um, so I start from the very minute details of the men in Sinai and zoom out to theater and art and, and politics and all of that. A very rich topic. Um, and so my last question then um, relates to people in Egypt itself um, in terms of their interest in history, um, whether it's pursuing the reformist movements of the 19th century or any other part of history that sort of connects to it. Um, what are, you know, questions they are pursuing? What are Egyptian scholars interested in today? Egypt has a very vibrant historiographical school, Egyptian uh, school of history. The Egyptian Historical Society is founded in 1948. Uh, it just had their elections for a new board of directors yesterday. Um, there are history departments in all universities uh, over the all over the country. Egypt has a very, very rich archives, national archives, which is where I did my research. Uh, but the Egyptian, in my mind, I want to say something critical now. The Egyptian school of history is still very much a nationalist school, telling the story of the nation rather than of individuals, of cities, of families, of individuals. Um, if you're asking me what kind of large questions, I don't think I can answer. There are many questions. 
there is an interest in Ottoman history, there's an interest in 20th century history. Uh, the closer you get to the current moment, the more difficult it is for Egyptian historians to engage with. So you don't really have historians, paradoxically, Egyptian historians do not write about the Arab-Israeli conflict. They think it's too close to home, too uncomfortable, and they, they think that they would lose their objectivity if they do so. So they work on earlier periods. They leave this, in other words, this big question to political scientists or to journalists, which I think affects how the public understands these periods. I want to add one last thing, which is um, it's been very, very gratifying for me. I mean, the reason I am active on social media is that I feel there's a demand. And there's a very positive reaction to my blogs and, and, and my YouTube channel, people, which are mostly historical topics. And people say, tell us more. So there is a, a hunger for, um, for um, historical knowledge and an awareness that the history that people learn in schools and public you know, is not enough for them. Um, so there's a suspicion of this kind of nationalist historiography that they are subjected to, and they are seeking something else. And in my humble ways, I'm trying to address this demand. That would be an interesting topic to explore, but unfortunately we're out of time. I mean, but it is an interesting one to think about because um, there seems to be a lot of hunger out there for Arabod. You know, there are. There's a reason why during Ramadan they have those television series which are all historical. Not all of them, obviously, there's, but there's a lot of historical stuff there. It's very popular. People are very interested in that. Um, I should uh, arrange to have someone talk about that at some point. Um, but Halifahami, thank you for talking to us. Today.